And then, and then what happens, particularly in the church, the church all, we all know, we all know, of course, we all know together what, what God's will is and what he, what he wants us to do and so forth. And then you read the words of Jesus and you go, wait a minute, he's not saying what everyone else is saying. You might try to find ways to go, well, he doesn't really mean that. But I'm thinking maybe what we could do since it's his church and we are his people bought by his blood going to his home, that instead of, of, of trying to get him to say, come to agree with us, is for us to move and agree with him. Even if we disagree with him, could I just invite you to join with me in agreeing with him? Uh, we may have to change our mind. Uh, let me give you an example of when, of when Jesus does that. Look in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 15. I just want to say to you, I guess, that it is dangerous to look to Jesus for, for his opinion and for his insight because he'll give it to you, right? Um, in, in, in Matthew chapter 15, um, Lori told me today that I go through the scriptures too fast and she can't keep up. So this is for Lori. Matthew chapter 15, starting in verse, um, starting in verse 10, after Jesus called the crowd to him, he said to them, Hear and understand. It is not what enters into the mouth that defiles the man, but what proceeds out of the mouth. This defiles the man. Then the disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this statement? See, the Pharisees all knew, of course, what defiles a man is what goes in the mouth. They all knew. Everyone was in agreement. All of the rabbis had researched this. They had taught it for generations. Of course, Whatever we touch defiles. Of course, we need to stand aside and be holy. Of course, if we eat pork, it defiles us. And Jesus comes along and says, uh, no, you're wrong. And the disciples go, you know you just offended them. Have you heard this term? So Jesus doubles down. You know you've just offended them. Je Jesus, what you just said, defended the religious. So he doubles down. He says, every plant which my heavenly Father did not plant shall be uprooted. Let them be alone. They are blind guides of the blind. And if a blind man guides a blind man, both will fall into a pit. You talk about double down. You know that that offended them because they think this way, and he goes, they're idiots. And everyone who follows them. See, going to Jesus for his opinion, for his point of view, can be a little dangerous because he just says stuff. So on this issue, he's got something to say and it might offend. The exact same type of a situation occurred in Jesus' day and they came to him and said, do you see this tragedy? Luke chapter 13. Luke 13. Tell me when you get there, Lord. I love you so much. You just remind me of my Aunt Virginia. Yeah. Luke chapter 13. Verses 1 through 5 to begin with. Now on the same occasion, there were some present who reported to him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Now here's a tragedy. Some people come to Jesus and said, Jesus, did you hear what happened last night? Did you, did you see the Google News, what happened last night? Galileans from your home your home area, Galileans, were killed by Pilate last night. And Jesus' response to that 
is this. Verse 2, do you suppose these Galileans were greater sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered this fate? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will likewise perish. And then he mentions another tragedy. He says, or do you suppose that those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed were worse culprits than all the men who live in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will likewise perish. Well, I don't think that CNN is going to want to hear that answer. I, I, don't, I don't think Fox News wants to hear that answer. What is Jesus saying? He's saying, you should not be asking, how did this tragedy happen? You should be asking how you got to stay alive. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. The question you need to be asking yourself is why were 750,000 El Pasoans allowed to live another moment? That's Jesus' response. Wait, that, that doesn't help us. Maybe it does. Let's consider for a moment. Jesus' response to the tragedy is not, well, you know what, guys, let me tell you. The Father and I, we do the best we can. We try to watch over the universe. When I take a break, he's usually on. Somehow we just miscommunicated, and this happened outside of our purview. And, and so but we'll try to work better at it and make sure that no one gets shot anymore. He doesn't say that. He says, the question is, why weren't you shot? That's, that's harsh. What is it that he's trying to say to us? In fact, what he does with this is he gives you a warning. He says, you need to check yourself because you could be shot tomorrow. He uses this as an opportunity to say, where are you with the Father? In fact, if I could, we all long to heal the community. Don't we want to take words of comfort? Don't we want to make sense of it? I want to do that. I want to go to the, I want to, I want to proclaim against violence. I want to cry out and say, what is this insanity? But what Jesus tells us to do is make sure everybody's saved before the next shooting. That's not the way I would have approached it. I'm just, I'm just reading his words. Let's go a little further in that same passage. Still in Luke chapter 13. He gives another warning. Look at verses 6 through 9. And he began telling this parable. A man had a fig tree. Uh, listen, this is getting ready to get rough, guys. Okay, This is not the American way of looking at things. A man had a fig tree which had been planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and did not find any. And he said to the vine keeper, Behold, for three years I've come looking for fruit in this fig tree without finding any. Cut it down. Why does it even use up the ground? And he answered and said to him, Let it alone, sir, for this year too, until I dig around it and put in fertilizer. And if it bears fruit next year, fine. But if not, cut it down. He puts that parable right in the same context as when he's saying, Hey, do you think they were worse sinners? What is Jesus saying? He's saying, Hey, you just saw that shooting, America. Are you, are you producing fruit? Because if you're not, I'm taking it all out. Let's look at it historically. Did you see these Galileans and how they were killed? Do you think they were worse than the rest of you? What Jesus says is this generation, his generation, the day that he was living, Jesus said, this generation in which I am living right now is the worst generation that has ever been on the planet. And then he points at, at the heart of them and says, do you see these stones? Not one will be left on top of the other. What parable is he giving to them? He's saying to them, I came looking for fruit. And you were too busy about your national things. And I'm trying to warn you, it's all coming down. 
Well, now wait, Pastor, I didn't want to hear about that. I wanted to hear about how America was going to be saved. There's some other churches. A prophet stands and warns and says destruction is on the horizon. Now, I'm not even talking about judgment. I'm not standing up here going, we're about to be judged for our sins. Look, all have been judged. All have been found condemned. Jesus said, I didn't come into the world to condemn the world. Why? Because it's already condemned. Do you see, his point is, the question is, how did you get to live another day? The whole world is condemned. And he says, only those who come to him escape the wrath. He's not looking at America and going, well, it's finally reached the point that I'm going to condemn it. We stood condemned at our birth. He looks at America and says, I came to find fruit. I'm going to have fruit. And if it's not you, it'll be somebody else. Here's what he said to the Israelites. He said, you're starting to see these tragedies happen in your lifetime. You're going to see this land that you are standing in right now you're going to see it running with blood. And there will be famine. There will be drought. There will be pestilence. There will be war. There will be slaughter. This is what Jesus said. Did it happen? It happened. Civil war broke out. In one year, four emperors were crowned and slaughtered each other. The the nation that he was standing in, guess what about, about the temple and the stones? Not one stone was left on top of another. He's in mercy, he's warning them. Jesus gives us a different way to look at things. Like, for instance, when we look at the ten plagues with Egypt, right? You look at that and you go, wow, those are the ten judgments. No, friends, those were ten of the greatest acts of mercy that have ever been displayed by God. He comes against the gods of Egypt and at the end of it all when he destroys that nation and he brings Israel out. Do you know what the Bible says? And a great host of Egyptians came out with them. A great host. Those weren't ten plagues. Those were ten mercies. Why? Because the salvation of our nation and the salvation of our flesh does not matter. The salvation of our souls is what we need to be concerned about. And the salvation of the souls of our brothers and sisters here in El Paso is what we need to be concerned about. How do I respond to the shootings? It's a wake-up call. It's a wake-up call. We need to get about the business of God in our city. Listen. Listen. It concerns me when I talk to Christians about the ending of all things and they're going, but wait, then I'll lose my pool table. No, I'm not kidding. This concerns me. We've we've got a problem. And Jesus is, is shaking us and he's going, wake up, disaster is coming. Wake up. Look at Matthew chapter 24. Uh, And you know what? I know somebody might be going, wow, you're not giving me a lot of comfort, Pastor. I came, I was looking for some sweet words. I mean, my, my heart is troubled. I'm looking for some sweet words. Look, if you're drowning in the river, I'm not going to try to eat the water for you. I want to throw you a lifeline. And you may say, well, that's not very loving. Couldn't couldn't you have made the rope a little softer? Matthew chapter 24, verses 1 and 2. Jesus came out from the temple and was going when his disciples came to point out the temple buildings to him. And he said to them, do you not see all these three things? Truly I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another which will not be torn down. I I want to just talk to you. You all know that I I am a student of history. Um, Throughout history, over and over and over and over, nations just like ours were brought down. And you've got to be a fool, a blind fool, to not look at that. Just like ours 
were brought down. What happened yesterday is a tragedy, and yet it is at the same time. He's saying, wake up, come to me. Now, so what are we supposed to do in response to this? When we, start, when we start thinking, is it possible that our civilization is about to crash? Wait, is he actually talking about the crash? Yes, I'm talking about it. I think I should, since he does. In fact, can I tell you something? Every civilization is going to crash. Can I share something with you? Not one stone will be left on top of another. The condemned sign is already placed. We're just waiting for the wrecking ball to come. Wait, Pastor, could you let's talk about something else? No, I'm going to talk about this. I want to talk about this. How are we to respond? I see Christians going, Well, I'm going to dig a bomb shelter. Really? Where, could, somebody show me in Scripture. Dig a bomb shelter. I'm going to stock up ammunition. Really? Does it say that? Is that what Jesus is responding? Does he instruct Christians? Does he say to Christians, Listen, when you see this happening, what you do is you buy all the ammo you can. Does he say, I want you to get the priest dried food? Is that what he says? What does he say? Flee. Right there in that same chapter. When you see this happening, flee. What did he say to Lot in Sodom and Gomorrah? Did he say, build a bomb shelter? Run. Run. And don't look back. Watch. How, how, can, how can I run? Pastor, where do I run to? The moon's not colonized. Where do I run to? Jesus says this in the book of Luke, and I love this. He says, listen, little flock. Listen, little flock. Right, right, Greg? He has given you the kingdom. He is pleased to give you the kingdom. Now, I'm not talking about physically running out of El Paso. I am talking, I am talking about mentally and spiritually fleeing from this world. Pastor Bernie, uh, he, he used to love to take me to camp, uh, pastor's conferences because I was crude. I had no etiquette. I, I would just say stuff that he always wanted to say, but he was too proper. And, and, and he would love to take, because I would, you know, I would shock. But when I would say these things, Pastor Bernie would go like this. <laughs> Saints, you need to take one giant step away from this system and this world. What does he say? That we are to live as strangers here. The American church over generations now over generations, has got more and more invested in the comfort here, and we are seeing the end of it. It's about to all come down. I am here calling to you saying, run, flee. Flee where? Into his arms. See, if, if I could get into your head the things that you own and the things that bring you happiness and the things that bring you to security not one stone will be left on top of the other. You will run to Jesus Christ, and that's where we're supposed to be. And we shouldn't have to wait for tragedies to come to do that. I'm calling out to you right now. When you see the city surrounded, when you see these prophecies coming to, to pass, run. And he says, don't go down and get your suitcase. Don't start packing stuff. Just you escape. Run to where? Run to Jesus. This physical body could be destroyed tomorrow. All that I own could be destroyed. If everything that I own were destroyed, I should be living in such a way that it doesn't even trouble me. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. You see, if I own the kingdom, if, I, if, if my thought process, if my, if my future, if my hope, if my career, if my ambition is all about Christ and his kingdom, and I lose my wife, I lose my kids, I lose everything. I have lost nothing. Why? Because the eternal is the only thing that is eternal. 
My wife and my children are there. I lose my arm. What does Jesus say? Better to pluck the eye out. He's trying to tell us. He's warning us. He's saying, church, my people, it has pleased me, little flock, to give you the kingdom. But what happens is, is we now I think I think over the last few months, points of view have begun to change a little bit. But for decades we have gone, education is our hope, the economy is our hope. Let's vote Trump in because he can get the economy going again. And after all, it's it's about the economy, stupid, right? Do you guys remember that line? It's about the if the economy's going, everybody's okay. Really? What would Jesus say? <laughs> He's got, if you have the greatest economy in the world and lose your soul. He would say, what has it profited you? Oh, we'll be safe if we have this. Well, if we can just do this, we'll be safe. Friends, can I share something with you? There is no safety here. Maria, in the next three seconds, your heart could stop beating, and nothing can stop that from happening. I don't care how hard you try. There is nothing you can do to stop that. We're all trying to be safe, be safe, be safe. I am safe in the arms of Jesus. Nothing can touch one hair of my head. My hope is not in a political party. My hope is not in the nation changing. And in fact, church, listen. If you are abiding in Christ and the word of Christ is abiding in you, when the nation you live in begins killing babies after birth, when the nation you live in begins punishing anyone who says marriage by God is between a man and a woman, when the nation you in, live in begins calling hate speech the things that Jesus says, you should just take a giant step away. Lord, save them. And just keep backing off. Lord, Notice I'm not with them. Lord, your kingdom, your will, I live for you. This is the biblical instruction to believers in times of crisis. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we proclaimed that? What is the answer to the tragedies? The first thing is this, Jesus declares the truth. While you're still alive, while you're still alive, turn to Christ for salvation. Well, what about those 20 some odd people that got killed? Man, that is horrible. But you know what? We've got a chance right now for you to come to Jesus. And if that happens to you, you will live for eternity. Little flock, hasn't he given you? Hasn't it pleased him to give you the kingdom? You see? Well, how do we stop this? I'm not sure we want to. I don't want to participate in it. I just want to focus on the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Now, let's do this for a moment. This is a really weird thing that I've been saying. It's not like what you're going to hear anywhere else except maybe in other churches. So let us discuss it. Let's talk about it. Maybe there's a disagreement. Maybe you're going, wait a minute, Pastor. We need to get guns. Or wait a, wait a minute, Pastor. We need to get rid of guns. Well, I mean, there are, there are Christians are on both sides of that. Right? What are your thoughts? Dolores? Very good. Isn't that it? I'm scared. You know what, sweetheart? Things are going to get worse. Get right with God. I think that is what Jesus was saying. What else? Who else has something? Yes, Ray? Yes. 
Yeah, when you, when people are saying peace and peace, at the end of time they were giving in marriage, they were they were totally invested in this world when it crashed, right? God hits the reset button over and over. Let me share a few of those. I talked to you a little bit about history. When the world had gotten so bad that every thought of man was evil, he sent a flood, and he had a man standing up preaching, going, a flood's coming. And he had the man build a boat. Why? To escape the flood. I love the fact that he didn't have them pegged to the outside of the boat either, and they weren't swinging in the storm. He put them in, he sealed the door, and they lived through it, right? When the sins of the Amorites had reached their fullness, because Jesus would, had promised, God had promised he would never send a flood again. When the sins of the Amorites had reached their fullness, he brought a flood of Israelites out of Egypt, and he washed the land of Palestine. And when the Israelites became so evil that every part of their thoughts were corrupt, he sent a flood of Babylonians who washed the land Palestine. Whenever the salvation message, when God's word can no longer be listened to, when no one can hear God's word, because he's about saving people, he sends a flood and he wipes it out. When we look at the immigration problem, it's not only here in the United States. Do you realize Finland just passed a law, you can't wear a burqa. In Germany, they're passing laws right now that no longer, in, uh, no longer can you have the tower that, that, that gives the call to prayer seven times a day. It's illegal. They're trying to hold off immigration. You have to ask yourself the question, why is there an immigration problem all over the world? Can I answer that for you? Because there are seven billion people. When I was in high school, it was four billion, and they said the end has come. There are seven billion people humans on this planet and they're looking for safety and they're looking for food and they are flooding the tower of babel we don't need god if we can just all come together we won't need god anymore that happened in world war one too europe declared the death of god what happened world war one happened God hits a reset button once in a while. You see, nobody wants to hear this, but what I'm telling you is God hits a reset. When the word of God no longer is being responded to, when evil reaches that point, when it becomes illegal to preach salvation, then he hits a reset. So what am I to do as a Christian? Run to the kingdom. Run to the kingdom. Quit being invested here. Live in this world, but don't be of this world. Don't put your hope in the things of this world. Your hope is in Jesus Christ. Amen? Grab a hold. Grab a hold and don't let go. Move yourself from compromised to all in. That's the word of God to us. Anyone else? Jack? Jack? Yes. Exactly. Yes. When the, Right. All right. So what you're saying, Jack, is I'm not insane. Well, no, you're not going that far. Okay, all right. 
when the, when the Twin Towers came down, what, is the, what should the Christian response have been? Not about, is God judging America, but about, oh my, 3,000 people just, just entered eternity somewhere. And what were we doing? Well, I was polishing my silverware set. These events, Jesus' answer is, preach. Preach. And wouldn't it be something, Mitch, wouldn't it be something if like your students could see this man's got security. He is there something about him. And they can come and ask you. Why, why are you so at peace? Because nothing can happen. Because I'm in the arms of Jesus and he's taking care of me. And if anything happens to this body, I got a new one. Right? Saints, it's not only about preaching. Remember that your sermons are in how you live. That's where you really preach is in how you live. Another thing, if I come to prayer, you, you, if you really are concerned and you are really worried about your city, I'm going to tell you, I hurt yesterday as I thought of all of the people, what they were thinking and what they were feeling. I hurt. But what answer do I have? First, I can pray. Second, I can live. Third, I can proclaim safety. Right to start proclaiming the name of Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Amen? All right, so here's how I want you to remember today's message. Now watch. Just remember that. Take a step away from the world and a step towards the kingdom. Right? Let's pray. Mitch, would you lead us in prayer, please? And ask the worship team to come.